Hey everybody, Jane here, and I'm coming to you today with my January 2020 wrap up. So this was actually kind of a rough reading month for me. I'm not really sure what happened. I definitely didn't read as many books as I typically did. I ended up finishing eight books. One of those is a graphic novel, but it still counts. So I'm on track to hit 100 at the end of the year so far, but definitely I typically read more than eight books in a month. Also, you will notice my star ratings were a little bit lower than typical, so I was kind of bummed about that too. It has just not been a great reading month, and it could be because of, its Janu of it being January. It could be 101 other things. I'm not really sure. But yeah, it's just been kind of a miss for me. This month, three of those books that were read were audio, three of those books that were read were library books, and two were from my own TBR. Uh, one of my goals this year was to read a closer ratio of library and owned books. None of these books were books that I won through giveaways or ARCs though, so I do want to make sure that in future months I'm prioritizing those. These were just backlist books from my shelf that were kind of calling to me, and with the kind of month it's been, I kind of just needed something warm and light and fuzzy to read. So let's go ahead and start going through the books that I read. The first one that I read was a graphic novel, and that was Pumpkinheads. This, I do believe, read the, or won the Goodreads Choice Awards last year for Best Graphic Novel. It is super cute. It is about two teenagers who are working in a pumpkin patch, and this is going to be their last season. They're about to go off to college. And they've been friends, they've been working at the Succotash hut together a lot, but they traded jobs with some friends so that he could go talk to this girl that he likes. And she's been trying to help him find this girl and get up the courage to talk to this girl. And it's mostly just kind of a, a story about hitting that crossroad in your life that you know things are going to change, you know things are going to be different, and it's a little bit scary. And it was very cute. They had a really cute friendship. The art is cute. It definitely is one I kind of wish I would have read closer to Halloween. I think I would have enjoyed a more autumn atmosphere with it, but it was pretty good. Um, I did give it a four out of five. I enjoyed it, but it didn't necessarily grab me or do anything spectacular, although I know a lot of people absolutely adore this. It was good. Don't get me wrong. It was good, but it was, it was a four. It was fine. The next book that I'm going to talk about is a reread for me, and that is Murder on the Links. This is a Hercule Poirot mystery, and basically Hercule Poirot gets a message that he is supposed to come because Mr. Reynold believes that he is his life is in danger. When Poirot arrives, Mr. Reynold is already dead. So Poirot and Hastings must investigate what is going on. I have talked about this book extensively, so I'm not going to say too much. Um, I felt this book was a little bit of a mess. I did give it a three star. I It is not my favorite Christie. Um, and as a matter of fact, I would say of the four full-length novels I've read so far, this is probably ranks my third. So I would say my top is The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, the next is The Mysterious of Ferret Styles, then this one, and then The Big Four, which is a complete mess. Uh, I, do, there, I did read a book of short stories, but I'm not a huge short story person, so I'm not really sure how to rank the short stories. But of the novels, this is pretty close to the bottom so far. I just found the whole thing very convoluted. Um, I am struggling a little bit with rereading Christy, or reading Christy so is the case maybe. Some of them are rereads, most of them are, are this is a reread because I did the movie adaptation to book. And I hoped that by reading the physical book, I would get more out of it and be able to process maybe what I missed, because I kind of felt like it was convoluted last time and I thought maybe I'm just missing stuff. I don't think I'm missing stuff, it's just convoluted. So this is probably not one I will reread. It, it's been fine, but I'm also glad it's over. So, Runner on the Links, 
fine, probably not going to be a favorite of Poirot. Uh, I, I do love Poirot as a character, but the mystery just fell flat for me. The next book I read, and this is the last of the library books that I read, is Final Gifts. And this is a nonfiction where a hospice nurse talks about the things that people say as they prepare for death. And I think I've just been in kind of a, a mood recently, and I just wanted a book that had some spiritualities, maybe not what I mean, but I needed to kind of, it's winter, and I kind of needed to do some confrontation about death, and this is something I needed. So this tells different stories of people who are dying and what they ask for before they die, what they need before they die, what are typical common death experiences that hospice nurses see a lot of. Um, I do follow several funeral channels, including Caitlin Dowdy, who talks about, um, the or who's part of the Order of the Good Death and talks about, you know, death awareness and, you know, having a, being comfortable with the fact that as a human, we are eventually going to die. So I think that was why I picked this up. It was fine. Um, it was a lot of little stories and it reads more like a short story collection with a little bit of, we see this a lot. Um, I enjoyed it. I just, I don't know, for whatever reason, I didn't feel particularly extra pulled in. I, I enjoyed it though, and it was a good nonfiction. So if you like nonfiction and you're looking for something about commonalities that people experience before they die, this is a good solid read. All right, so those were my library books. Next, I'm going to go through my physical books. These are the two books that I physically owned that were on my shelf and that will be moving on to new homes. Neither of them is a new favorite. They were both good, not new favorites. So the first one, and this is kind of like the theme of the last book, was All Pets Go to Heaven. And this is Sylvia Brown and her take on where animals fit in to the universe, the spiritual realm, etc. Its tagline is the spiritual lives of the animals we love. And I did enjoy this, but by the end, it felt more like a book about like a chicken soup for the animal lover soul. It was about, oh, these animals are all in tune with the spirit world and they rescue people and they heal people and they alert people to danger. And it was a lot of we love animals, which was fine. But I think I really wanted more and I've never read a Sylvia Brown before. I wanted more of like how she sees the world as a psychic, her beliefs and ideas about how things in the universe work. And we do get some of that. Um, I do think there are some flaws in her logic because one thing she talks about is, you know, the earth is really created for humans to be tested and, you know, animals are these pure beings so they don't reincarnate or anything. But my thought is, if the world is created for humans to test humans, why were humans not alive for millions and millions of years when animals were? And I, again, I haven't read her stuff before. Maybe she has explanations. Maybe nobody's ever asked. Like most spiritual things, I take what she says with a grain of salt. But that was one issue with the logic I had of, you know, oh, animals don't have to reincarnate because they're perfect. And this world is just about, you know, humans perfecting their soul. Well, there was millions of years before humans came that there was just animals. Um, one thing that I did love that she talked about was that animals can do unpredictable and terrible things. Um, they're, now, she says they're not bad. It's just, you know, genetics and madness and all kinds of things. Because she talks about a pit bull that had been a loving family pet and unprovoked attacked its owner and the, the family was so distraught because this dog was a much loved dog and they just couldn't believe that out of nowhere this dog attacked them so i did i was glad that it wasn't all all fluffy and frilly 
If you love animals and stories about animals, you will probably enjoy this if it aligns with your spiritual beliefs. If you're going into this as a, I'm curious what this psychic view on the world is, maybe I didn't get as much as that, of that as I would have liked. Again, I've never read her stuff before. I will be reading more because I'm curious. And like I said, I'm kind of taking a little bit of a spiritual journey. It's January. Everything around us is dead. And I think it's time to reach out to the spiritual realm, especially since I don't have a concrete religion to explain my world to me. It's nice to reach out and see, you know, number one, what people experience as they die, because we're all going to die. And what this particular person thinks happens after death, who, you know, thinks that she has answers beyond what normal people do. So, good read. I was interested. I had a good time. Did get a little bored at the end because it was just like, okay, just story after story is about animals being amazing. I didn't pick up chicken soup for the animal lover soul, but especially that end, that's kind of what this felt like. The other book that was on my shelf. And I really debated whether I was going to give this one a star rating because I move in the same circles as this author. I do feel like I am giving it a fair review because while I move in the same circles of this author, I'm not particularly friends with them. I've met them. We've gone to the same writers meetings. We are in, there's a couple different groups of writers groups around where I live. and. He's a member of several of them. I've gone to several of them, so we've crossed paths, but we haven't spent a long, long time together. So I do feel like I could accurately review this book, but be aware that I do have an acquaintanceship with this author. And that is Alex Erickson. Um, and the book is The Pomeranian Always Barks Twice. Um, this is a Barnes and Noble exclusive, or at least it what? Oh, until 331.20. So it's about to not be Barnes and Noble exclusive anymore if you prefer not to get your books at Barnes and Noble. Um, I do did think I saw it on Amazon, but it's possible it was a pre-order, and it's possible that the exclusive is only physical copy. I'm not sure. But anyway, this book is a first in a new series. And it is about a woman named Liz, and she and her family owns a pet rescue. So it's Liz, her husband, Manny, who is a veterinarian, her son, Ben, who helps with the animals, and their daughter, I believe her name is Amelia. So in this book, they, Liz and her son, Ben, are about to pick up a Pomeranian named Stewie. His owner is moving to a nursing home. Uh, he's elderly and unable to care for himself. And so Liz and Ben go to pick up this Pomeranian to rehome him. When they get there, there is another set of pet rescuers there who think that they're supposed to be taking the dog instead. There's some confusion about this. And the other pet rescuers are maybe not not in it for the same reasons that Liz and her family are in it. Um, the other pet rescue people are kind of trying to make money off of pet rescue as opposed to Liz who's just trying to rehome animals and you know do her best to make sure that these animals that, that have to be removed from their situations can find a new healthy, happy, loving home. So while they are there, Liz decides to that they need to just wait that it's not the right time for them to take the dog because obviously there's all this confusion and the elderly man is becoming upset his nurse is there his son is there his son is upset everybody's upset so she decides okay you know i'm going to go talk to this other rescue lady hopefully we can get it sorted out amongst ourselves and her son benjamin notices a girl who is sunbathing over in the corner, uh, like across the street. And he's in his 20s, so he's a hot-blooded male. He's like, I gotta go talk to her mom. So Ben goes over and talks to the girl. Liz and this other lady go off to talk. Liz comes back after the girl has decided that yes, Liz can have the dog because it's an old dog. It's not gonna make her a lot of money when she rehomes it. 
who knows why she decides that it, it, it doesn't, she, Liz can have the dog. Liz comes back to get the dog and suddenly everything is a mess. There are police cars everywhere and we find out that the elderly man has been murdered. And an eyewitness saw Ben enter the house. There is blood on Ben's clothing and but Ben is accused. So Ben swears he doesn't know how the blood got on his clothing. He wasn't there. He has no idea what is going on. He has not left Bikini Lady this whole time. Bikini Lady says, well, yeah, he's been here, but he took a bathroom break at one point. It was kind of long, and I fell asleep, and I just don't know. So Liz takes it upon herself to solve this mystery to save her son from, you know, going to jail for the rest of his life for murdering this elderly man who they just met. I gave this book a three out of five. There were some things I really liked about it. Um, I do like it better than his other series. So um, this author has another series that is a coffee shop owner. And I've read a couple in that series and I just have a real hard time connecting with them. So I really was excited to try a new series of, of his because I knew that the coffee house one just wasn't really ticking my buttons. I do have a couple more I want to read, but I really was hopeful this would work out for me better. And it, it does. I do like it better. I like that Liz is a mature, more mature woman, whereas in his Coffee House series, the main character is a younger woman. I also like Liz's family's involvement, and I love that the stakes were high. As a mother, I can totally relate to wanting to save your child. On the other hand, though, I just, I didn't love the characters. I, while I appreciated the stakes and I liked them better than the Coffee House mysteries, I still didn't connect super deeply with Liz, even though I understood and empathized with her struggle. I just, for whatever reason, she missed the mark a little bit for me. I loved the animals they were rescuing, including they have a cat at their house that is a permanent resident named Wheels, who is a differently, a, a differently abled cat. So he has paralysis of the back leg and so has like wheels that help him get around. I love that. I loved the rest representation of that. And also just, it was a fun thing to add. I could have done with a little more animals in, in the book, considering it is a pet rescue book. But you know, the ones that were there, I had a good time with. The mystery itself, didn't so much work for me. I, it was fine. I guessed who it was a little bit ahead of time, but I just, I don't know. I, it, it was fine. It was a fine, it was a good solid mystery, but nothing I would rave about or tell everybody in the world they should pick up. It was just not something I super connected with. So I did enjoy it. If you like mysteries and you like animal rescues and you like slightly more mature, you know, main characters who are not, you know, 20 something shop owners, this is a book worth trying. You might enjoy it a little bit more than I did. Okay, so the last three books are audiobooks. And each one I'm doing a video about, a uh, video review of, so I'm going to be kind of brief with these, um, these three audiobooks. So there was Cujo by Stephen King, which I gave a 3.5. Cujo, for anybody who doesn't know, is about a dog who becomes rabid and a mother and son who are trapped with this rabid dog. Um, Stephen King is a master at writing, but his writing style sometimes annoys me. I love that he doesn't look away from things. I thought the scenes with the dog attacking were incredibly strong. On the other hand, I felt that sometimes he did or said things for shock value, and I didn't appreciate that. I didn't need the shock value. I just, I wanted the story. The story also was very long. I listened to the audiobook, and I think it was 14 hours long. And it really didn't need to be. Like, I watched the movie. The movie is an hour and a half, and you could have definitely done the book in that. <laughs> there's a lot of, in the book, there's a lot of side plots and side characters. And I didn't necessarily think all of them were necessary or interesting. And sometimes it was just like, 
I, I wanted a book about a rabid dog and it took forever to get to the rabid dog and the rabid dog played a part in the story but then you have all these and this is why they're not getting rescued right now because this circumstance and this circumstance and this circumstance and I was like mom and kid trapped with dog that's what I really want I don't need to hear about this person who I will never hear about again and is on stage for five minutes telling me about their flatulence and they think they have cancer because they're farting too much and they are only there to tell us why this person can't come and rescue them. So I just, I don't know, it just, there were things I really loved and I loved that, that I, I thought the ending was well done, it surprised me. Um, there were some really good moments, but overall, Cujo was not quite what I wanted it to be. I did give it a 3.5 because I felt it was too strong to be a 3 because it's definitely above average, but I didn't like it quite enough to give it a 4. So take from that what you will. It was good. It just wasn't where I would have wanted it to be, and I felt like there could have been some fat trimmed around it that would have made it a lot stronger read for me, and it could have probably been an 8-hour read instead of a 14-hour read. The next audiobook I did was Down Among the Sticks and Bones. This is book two in the Wayward Children series and follows Jack and Jill prior to their going to the school in book one, Every Hearted Doorway. So Jack and Jill are twin sisters who are born into a family and given very strict roles. Their parents very much are like, okay, you're going to be the boy, you're going to be the girl, and not like a literal boy, but like a tomboy. So you're all sportsy and messy, you have to be neurotically clean. And they raise them very separately in those roles, which causes problems with the twins. Then they go into their portal world, and they somewhat get a role reversal. Jillian, who has always been the tomboy, sportsy girl, ends up being the daughter of the vampire prince, uh, vampire king. So she's being raised as a princess. And Jack, Jacqueline, has always been the frilly prissy girl, and she goes to work as the mad scientist apprentice. I don't think any of this is spoilers, because if you've read the first book, you kind of know how all this goes down. Uh, it was fine. I gave it a three out of five stars. I didn't like it as much as the first book. I do like that it talked about things like the roles that we take on, that our parents give us, our choices about those roles, but I felt like it, I felt like the storytelling was kind of weird. It was very um, info dumpy, but in a fairy tale type way, so I did, it was an engaging info dump. like. We start before the children are born and their parents should never have had children and then they decided to have children for this reason and then this and this and this and so i didn't i the style wasn't quite as engaging as i would have liked also once they got into the portal world i felt like there wasn't much there was them getting there them getting assigned their roles and then years and years and years passed <laughs> and then this thing happens and then there's the portal world and it just is kind of, it, it just, I felt like I was missing some stuff. It was nice, but it wasn't as good as the first one. And I, I could have done with it being done very differently than it was. But it was a short read. And like I said, I did like some of the questions it asked. I just didn't connect with it as well as the first book. And the last book I read. And this was on my five-star predictions. And that is, do you want to start a scandal? Um, so I posted my five-star predictions at the beginning of February, maybe, but I recorded it in the middle of January. So basically after I recorded it is when I started reading, do you want to start a scandal? If you do not want to know what I gave this, you are welcome to pop off now and wait until my um, I do my like five-star video wrap-up and see whether I, or not I gave it five stars. I will tell you before I give you the rating kind of what it's about. So it is book four in the Castle Ever After series that is also a connector book to the Spindle Cove series, which I've not read. It is about a girl named Charlotte 
and it is about Piers, who we met in book two of the Castles Ever After series. Piers was engaged to a girl, and his brother ended up marrying her, and Piers is now single. He and Charlotte are at a house party, and she believes her mother is going to try to set them up, because she, her mother's been trying to hook her up with an aristocrat for a while. She has kind of a reputation. So she is in the library warning Piers that this is potentially a problem, but that she doesn't want to marry him and that he shouldn't feel obligated and she's going to do her best to, you know, thwart her mother. Well, unfortunately, as they are sitting there talking, a couple comes in, so they are forced to kind of hide behind a curtain so as not to get caught together, and this couple starts becoming intimate. They leave, but then Piers and Charlotte are discovered, and it is believed that they are the ones who are getting intimate. And so Piers is like, we'll get married. Which, of course, Charlotte's mom is like, yay, everything I ever wanted. But Charlotte doesn't really want to marry him because she wants to go on a grand tour with her best friend. So she says, oh, we'll figure out who the actual fornicators were and get them to confess so that we don't have to get married. But, of course, as this is going on and she's trying to solve the mystery, they fall in love. All right, so I am going to be doing a whole video review about that after my five-star predictions update video. So if you don't want to hear whether or not this one was a five-star, if that's going to ruin anything for you, hop off now. Because otherwise I'm going to tell you whether it was a five-star for me and what worked and what didn't. All right, going into it in three, two, one. So the You Want to Start a Scandal was not a five-star for me. It was a four-star. Right now, and I hate to say this because if I say this, the next book will be will be a three star. But I really love Tessa Dare's style, so I have a hard time imagining a book of hers so far under a four star for me. They definitely are above the typical romances I read. I really do enjoy them. I didn't enjoy this one as much as the others in the series, and I think part of it is because it was so different. I had not read the Spindle Cove books, and maybe if I had, I would have had a kinder view of Charlotte. But I didn't really like Charlotte as a character. Um, number one, she's very young. And I would say that in maturity, compared to the other girls in the series, she's probably the youngest slash most immature. The other women in the series have, of the uh, Castles Ever After series, have been given a castle. And are have the opportunity to be independent and are trying to keep that opportunity to be independent and then fall in love and choose love over this potential independence that they could have since they own property that is not what this story is and this story only falls into the story or into that series i think because Piers was in that series he was supposed to be the husband in book two but his brother ended up stealing his woman <laughs> After she got a castle and was like, I don't have to marry you. And his brother's like, yes, you should marry my brother. Here, I'll romance you so that you're all ready to have her wedding. And then she's like, oh, I love you, not your brother. So anyway, um, I definitely didn't like Charlotte as well as I liked the other characters. She's very focused on her friendship. She's very focused on, I want to go on this grand tour. And I just, I didn't feel though, and maybe this is because I hadn't read the Spindle Cove books, I didn't feel like we got a lot of her and her friend. I don't didn't feel like we got as much of like her relationships with other people as we did in the Castles Ever After with the side characters. I did like Piers, and I wasn't sure if I would. I did like Piers, although there were times he made me very angry. So at the beginning of the book, when he's all like, yes, let's just get married. He's basically like, you're hot and I need an heir, and so this works great. And that kind of was ugh, to me. Then he gets to know her and starts to fall in love with her. And we see that, you know, his biggest issue with these relation this relationship is he's a spy. And he's worried about her safety, he's worried about his government secrets, and balancing what it means to be a person in 
the position of a of a spy or a government agent or a soldier um with being a family man and having formerly been married to a soldier this was kind of an issue we had in our marriage so i really related to the situation um and i felt sympathy towards peers for the difficulty of you know my loyalty to the crown my loyalty to my wife wanting to protect my wife and you know at the same time the dangers of my job so i did like peers overall um he did some stupid stuff near the end of the book that i wanted to slap him but i, I got where he was coming from most of the time so i didn't like charlotte as much i did like him I liked that there was a mystery subplot, but I didn't end up really liking the way the mystery subplot came together at the end. I want to say that it is very appropriate for the genre, but I was really frustrated with it because it didn't, it, it felt like a letdown, even though it was very appropriate for the genre. The other complaint I have, and this is just a personal one, is in The Castles Ever After, everybody before that, this couple, had a pet. And I think this book was really missing a pet. So in the first Castles Ever After, there is a weasel. The second one, there is a dog, Pierce's dog, who dies um, eventually, like before this book, so Pierce couldn't have his dog with him. And then the third book, there is a lobster. There weren't pets in this book, and I think there needed to be. So I did enjoy it. It just... it definitely wasn't what I was wanting. Charlotte was not somebody I could really relate to. I found her very young and kind of annoying. I understood Pierce, but he made some dumb decisions. I liked the mystery element, but I didn't like the resolution of the mystery, and there were just not enough cute little pets running around. So yeah, not a five star. All that being said, that was my January reading month. I am really hoping February is better. That just felt kind of like a wet down month and I just I'm not sure if it's me <laughs> and that's one thing I will say like January is a hard month for me um I, it just is hard so I'm not sure how much of that if I would have read these books in different months if I would have liked them a little bit more or if I am judging them pretty fairly and they were just all misses I feel like they were just all misses and I'm being fair but it's cold out it's hard to say so yeah that has been my January wrap-up Please tell me what you've read this month. Also, if you've read any of these books, did you have similar feelings? Did you have very different feelings? If you have read any of Sylvia Brown, what books should I be reading from her? I know my library has some. I'm basically just curious about her view on spirituality and how the universe works, I think. Um, I've read a lot of books on that. I, I just basically, about nine years ago, I left the religion I was raised in. And I don't have a desire to be part of organized religion, but I've also found that having no answers and no ideas about how death and the universe and the afterlife work can be stressful and anxiety inducing. I would almost rather have wrong answers then no answers at all, uh, which I learned after my grandmother died. Uh, my grandmother died and she was incredibly religious. And I envied that she could believe the things she did because even if they weren't true, even if there's nothing after we die, she had a lot of hope and a lot of excitement for her death. You know, she was very excited to die because she was going to see her husband again. She was going to see her best friend. She was going to see my uncle who had died and my cousin who had died and so you know she really didn't have she had a very good death she had a very good death a very eager death she was not afraid she was not worried she was not oh my gosh what's gonna happen she's like i'm going to jesus and i'm gonna see all the people i love and one of the challenges of not being able to have a religious belief is that you lack that that you lack that certainty that you lack that you know, when people like you love die, you lack that we're going to see them again. And I'd like to see other takes on spirituality so that I can kind of get my views because I found I am not a good atheist. Um, I just, 
I was raised very religious, so atheism is not for me. Um, agnosticism is probably what I will end up calling myself because I feel like there's just not a good answer. We probably don't have the actual answer, but I would still like to see other people's views on religion, spirituality, and the way the world works. And since Sylvia Brown claims she's a psychic, I'd really be interested in to see how a psychic interprets the universe. What answer she does have and doesn't have, and, you know, maybe decide if I agree with any of that. Um, so yeah, if you've read these, let me know what you thought. If you read anything else this month that was good or bad, let me know below your best or worst read. Um, if you are new here and would like more content, please subscribe. There's also links down below to all of my social media should you like to connect with me off of YouTube. Included in those links are links to my books. I am a romance author and um, you can get my books um, on various sites. On Smashwords right now, my book Wedding the Widow is free. So if you uh, use Smashwords or would like to use Smashwords, it is a free service. You just have to have a login. You can download Wedding the Widow for free. And, and that the Smashwords page is connected down there. If you are typically somebody who gets their books through Amazon, I have a few of my newer releases in the Kindle Unlimited program. So if you have that, you can read those for free. I also have several audiobooks on Audible. So if you have extra credits and are looking for something to read, and or if you are part of the romance package, you can read me for free there. So lots of ways to check me out if you have any interest in the romance books I write. Uh, this is Jane, and I will be seeing you next time. Thanks. Bye.